Derek, thank you so much for taking the time today. I'm when I started this podcast two years ago, I said to myself, okay, Derek Sivers is somebody who I dream of one day having on this podcast. And the reason for that is because you, to me, represent somebody who's thoughtful, kind, hardworking, uh, just somebody who, if somebody else likes them, I know that that's my <laughs> type of person. So for all those reasons, I just want to thank you for Thanks, being here Kenny. today. Yeah. So on that note, you are, you attract an intelligent type of person to me. It seems like all the people who, who follow your work are that the best word I could use to describe them is intelligent or thoughtful maybe, but I'm curious from your perspective, how do you attract an intelligent audience? Well, how do you attract such intelligent guests on your show, Danny? (laughs) Um, no, actually, I have no idea, um, but I could guess. It's not on purpose, right? But let's say three things. Um, I think different types of media attract different people. So the most popular page mm-hmm. on my website is the list of books that I've read for, since, I don't know, it's like 350 books on there I've read since 2007. And that's the most popular page on my site. That's how a lot of people find me. So... You could say that already, like, nonfiction books attract a different type of audience than TikTok, for example. And so, because people are drawn to my website because of this list of nonfiction books, um, that helps narrow it down. But then let's say, like, conversely, um, I avoid TV. Like, I won't go on TV. I want nothing to do with TV. I think it's like a terrible hype machine, and I hate that. Uh I hate the sound of it. I hate the the attention grabbing. Um, my friend Tim Ferriss, I think, made a big mistake when he pursued TV. Um, he was pursuing maximum fame, and I think he it's it was a mistake because it attracted a lot of crazies. So I don't know if you've seen his post about the way he has to live his life now because of the crazies that have been drawn to him. But I think that was because of the choice of media, right? I think it was because it was TV. So I think you need to choose your media outlet to choose your audience. Um, I also, I don't do anything timeless, right? So I'm sorry, I don't do anything timely. So I think uh, Mm -hmm. timeless subjects attract deeper thinkers than timely topics, Mm -hmm. right? So um, by timely, I mean, you know, current events, and all these things that people like to react to with social signaling and outrage to show what they stand for, suddenly changing their Twitter header to something to signal that they are for Ukraine or whatever it may be. That stuff may get more clicks, but I think it attracts a a reactionary type of person. And I want nothing to do with that. I also don't consume it. I just, I hate that stuff. I have no interest in it. Um, I refuse to react. I, I, I like to be proactive, not reactive. Um, and so I always try to take a philosophical angle, trying to find a more interesting point of view. Um, also, I think the the way that you present yourself to the world shows who you are. So if you go to my website, um, sive.rs, you'll see it's just plain text. There's like no... Uh, no graphics, no jump out, pop up, look at me, hypey kind of things. Uh, and even the covers of my books are just plain text. And I think that kind of quietly indicates to people what they can expect here is like a hype free, quiet, thoughtful place. That's my guess. It was a flattering question. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well,. I'm curious if today you think that it it is more necessary because I I want to be thoughtful and I attempt to be thoughtful in everything I do but I also feel the pull of social media and the pull of oh you you want an audience of people to be attracted to your message so maybe you could make money doing this or maybe this could be your profession so it's hard for it feels hard for me 
to navigate those two waters of thoughtfulness and also trying to quote unquote build an audience. Right. What's your perspective on that? Um, I'd rather earn the respect of 10 people I admire than a million people mm. I don't. So I think it requires patience to to be more thoughtful and do things in, in this unhyped way, like to avoid the the noisy chatter of the reactionary stuff. Um, but honestly, I think you're doing everything you're doing. I think you're doing right. It's like you're not jumping on bandwagons and shouting about daily American politics, reacting to what happened in the news today and all the stuff that you could be doing to to get. Uh, to attract a, a giant dumb audience. You're not doing that either. So I think you are <laughs> doing it right. Um, and if you wanted to even ramp down the uh, promotional efforts a bit, then you just have to have the patience uh, to know that it will bring in the right kind of person. Mm. Well, for you, did you ever have trouble with any of the social media platforms and especially when they started to become addicting, yeah. right? There was a point I'm sure you've seen the whole evolution of the web yeah. thus far. And I'm sure at first it wasn't like they were programmed. The best computer scientists were programming to get your and capture your attention. But now it's like the person that's on social media has to deal with that. So for you, have you, had any difficulty resisting the temptation of services like Twitter or Facebook? Or was that never an issue for um, you? No, I'm not tempted because, well, I mean, for one, I just hate that whole world of the overhyped drama, the reactionary, the noise, the, you know, people reacting to what a politician said today. It's the it's same reason I've always hated TV, right? It, it has a certain... Uh, flashy hype to it that I just it's like a music that I don't like you know it's like if we can think of that whole world as a kind of music I don't like that kind of music so I don't listen to it um it's all uh it's all noise and almost no signal right whereas you reading a book offline is like all signal and no noise but okay I think the the bigger issue here though is that I have a constant sense of urgency all right, like I'm 52 and that might have something to do with it. This sense of like, I don't know how much time I have left, but I think I've always been this way. Like there's something I want so badly that I'm on this mission and everything else is a stupid distraction because I really want this one thing. And so I see everything else as a distraction, right? So mm. let's go all the way back to like when I was a teenager, I wanted so badly to be a, a great musician that I would just practice like every waking hour and my friends would try to get me to come hang out with them and try to get me to go to parties or uh, get drunk or get high with them or whatever. And I just refused because I'm like, no, I'm trying to be great. Like, I don't, they thought I was ridiculous. They would tease me for being a workaholic musician, right? It seems almost like a, uh, uh, a contradiction. But then later when I started CD Baby, then I was like head down on this mission to help musicians. Um, just like 7 a.m. to midnight, seven days a week, this one thing. And people would try to get me to hang out and come to dinner, relax. Why don't you, you know, hey, a bunch of us are going to this thing. You've been invited to whatever, Richard Branson's island. Come on, come to Necker Island. I'm like, no, I'm trying to work. <laughs> and so since selling CD Baby now, it's like my mission is to try to be the best writer I can be, which means like more insightful, mm -hmm. trying to understand life better, trying to find a, another perspective. And that's what I'm really doing. And everything else just seems like a distraction. You know, like, hey, come come to Fiji with us. No, come look at Twitter. Look at what people are shouting about today. Hey, look what people are angry about. No, it's just I'm not even tempted. I hate that stuff. So, uh, no, I don't have any social media apps on my phone. I'm not um, tempted. Sorry. But that might explain yeah, why. But on that point, <laughs> okay, well, a couple of things. That that view of Twitter assumes that it's 
all negative or it's going to be negative. There are there are pockets, right. I feel, of Twitter, maybe that are not more insightful than long written books, but there are definitely insights about, I guess, maybe the modern world that are interesting and thought provoking and are in alignment with your philosophy, I would argue. Yeah. Um, but maybe you're you're better served finding those in in faraway books. But I'm curious about the obsession piece of it. Why were you so obsessed to be a musician back then? And why are you so obsessed to be a writer now? I think it's like, wait, actually, you know what? I, you brought up a really good point. Let's go back 20 seconds to, you, you said the interesting pockets. I think, I hadn't thought about this in a while, but a long time ago I had the idea that when people would tell me to check out this website or this Twitter thread or whatever, I think my idea is that if it's important, it'll make its way to a book. So if I use books as like a natural filter, um, I thought about this more with the news. When somebody says like, hey, why don't you watch the news? I'm like, because if there's something in the news that's important, then someday it will make it into a book. Like ideally we would read last year's news summarized and then you wouldn't have to get involved into weekly dramas. You would just, just hear what's important that I needed to know that happened last year. Right. Um, you could even do that weekly. Like just give me the weekly summary of what I needed to know from last week. If you want to stay up on weekly news. Um, but then I think I have that even with threads that might happen on, Twitter, for example, um, I think if it's really important, then this knowledge will make its way into a book. And it's also maybe just that there's so much out there to learn that's already in books that I'd rather just learn that. Um, and, and and it's this, this um, the JOMO, right? The joy of missing out, of saying, like, you know what? I'm happy to, like, everybody else seems focused on whatever the current hype is. And if you're trying to distinguish yourself as a thinker and find a different point of view on things, then you should deliberately avoid the current um, zeitgeist. In fact, wait, so sorry, you're, you're bringing up some stuff that I'm, I haven't thought of in a long time. Led Zeppelin um, was before my time, but I was a fan of their music. And I read once in an interview with Robert Plant, the singer of Led Zeppelin, he said that like during the 70s, um, when they were at their peak, people asked them why they sounded so different from all the other music at the time. Mm. And he said, because we all live in the middle of farms in Wales, like we're not part of the London or New York or L.A. scene. We just don't even hear what's going on. We're just off in the wilderness writing our music. So, of course, it just doesn't sound anything like other people. So that idea really affected me. This idea, like, if you don't want to think like everyone else, then don't take in the same stuff they're taking in. Like, look for different inputs. Um, they're not the usual thing. So I think that's another reason I deliberately avoid even the best of what's going on on Twitter, for example, because I assume, like, that's the conversation that everybody else is in. I'd rather read some old book that nobody's reading and develop some different kinds of thoughts from that so that my voice is not just the same voice that everybody else has today. Do you know what I mean? I'm not putting this very well, but I, I hope that idea comes across. You are putting it well. And I'm curious, what are the inputs that are most influencing you in this current moment? Oh, just if at any, whenever you're listening to this show, whether it's this week or years from now, go to, if you go to my website, sive.rs slash book, that's where I put my list of the books that I'm reading. And I always like the day I finish a book, I post it there with my full notes and everything. So uh, every week you can see what I'm reading this week because I post it there immediately. So um, yeah, right now, like literally today, I'm reading a fascinating book that's applying Buddhism to uh, marriage counseling. Hmm. Yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Um, it's well, I'm curious. Well, it's, just, it's so interesting. Yeah, but it's like, you know, um, yeah, it's just talking about like emotions are fleeting and a lot of people, especially in relationships, think that 
you know, I'm angry at you, therefore this is something we really need to talk about, and this is a problem because I'm angry. We need to talk about this. But the it's like a marriage counselor who's been doing this for decades says, no, like, look at look at the fact that emotions are not real things. They're just fleeting. It's a state of mood. It's not... Uh, emotions are not representing reality in some way. They're not teaching you about the state of the world. It's just teaching you about nothing but your current state of mind. And, um, yeah, anyway, I was just, like, reading it last night and this morning, so to answer your today question. Well, but... it's interesting because... Here it goes. <laughs> Yeah, I know you don't deal a lot with today, so I'm sorry to bring you back. <laughs> oh, no, to, come on, dude! <laughs> to today, <laughs> um, I don't mean to sound like I'm, I'm uh, you know, um, hating of all things present because that's definitely not true. I think the the thing I said about Led Zeppelin is probably more accurate. I think I deliberately avoid the current conversation because it feels like plenty of people have their attention on that. I'd rather find this dusty old book mm. and dive into that deeper to see if I can find a different angle that others aren't uh, drowning in already. Yeah, and, and How to Live, the book, which everybody should read and check out, is when I, I read it and then I reread it as if I was somebody in 2100. Oh, nice. And obviously, I, I have no idea what it would feel like to live in 2100, but I noticed that all the words are simple and I mean that in the best way possible all the phrasing is stuff that you would assume that people might be able to understand in a different era and I'm curious if that was yes, intentional you're the first person to mention that I often I think about a third of the people I email with are not uh, from the US or I should say English is not their first language so I'm deliberately constantly thinking of a simple way to say things in fact somebody said the the mm. it's it's not that english is the world's number one language the world's number one language is actually bad english <laughs> because english as a second language mm. is the most popular language in the world some of us born in america uh u.s um england australia new zealand um have english as our first language but for most of the world english as a second language is their language. And so I'm always kind of trying to do simplified English. But at the same time, that also helps me simplify my thoughts or get to the essence of my thoughts and make sure that I'm not actually accidentally using catchphrases that I grew up with, for example. Um, have you ever heard of the language Tokipona? I've okay. never. T-O-K-I-P-O-N-A. Tokipona. Uh, this linguist invented a new language that deliberately only has, I forget how many words, let's say like 50 words, because she found as a linguist that the, oh God, I'm not going to describe this well, but like if you, simplifying the way you express a thought helps you simplify the thought itself in your head, which she found gave her more peace of mind to simplify her thoughts. So she invented a language called Tokipona, where you have to simplify your thoughts in order to communicate with this language that has only 50 words. It's fascinating. And I had heard of it for years. Um, and I was learning a different simple language called Esperanto when I ran into uh, this woman in Singapore, who was a fellow Esperanto speaker. So we met up at a restaurant to speak for two or three hours only in the language Esperanto. And then I found out she is the woman that invented Tokipona. I was like, that was like was totally starstruck. I was like, oh my God, you're the Tokipona woman. And I wanted to try to like speak with her in English so I could nerd out about this, but she refused to speak anything but Esperanto with me. So we had a conversation in Esperanto with the inventor of Tokipona. How's that for a tangent? Sorry, <laughs> what were we talking about? <laughs> No, do not apologize for going down the rabbit holes. I believe some of the rabbit holes are the best places to find mm -hmm. true wisdom. And that is fascinating. Okay, so... Oh, simple language. Yes, sorry, you were talking about, about you read but... How to Live. Yes, a uh, hundred years from now or, yes. you know, somebody in Mongolia is yes. reading it uh, with simple English. Yeah, I just got an email yesterday from somebody in 
Japan, who said that they have a hard time reading English, but found my book very easy to read and said, thank you. I think this is the first time I've finished an English book cover to cover. Um, so wow. that's, that's a great compliment. Yeah. It's a, it's a deep sign of empathy, I believe, for different types of people from different backgrounds of like, I don't assume that you know what I'm all about and how I express things. And I noticed you did this on a previous podcast I was listening to where you were speaking to somebody from Australia and you, you asked them, hey, do you know what two cents means when you were explaining a story? And I thought that was such a clear indication of you having empathy for the other person. I don't assume you know what two cents means. And because of that, I'm going to ask to be kind. Thank you. It's been one of my favorite things about leaving America and living around the world has been mm. it. Yeah, it upsets all of your assumptions and makes you realize what you were assuming. So thanks for noticing that. Yeah, absolutely. Do you, so America as a cult, a culture and a country is very individualist, or at least it's known as that. Has that played true as somebody who has lived in so many different places throughout the world of the United States is really like that. And it's, it, is it even more pronounced than you expected or less pronounced? More so than I expected. Okay. So like anybody, I, I mean, I think no matter where you grew up, you feel that the way you do things is kind of like the center of the world. Like if you can imagine a spectrum, we all kind of imagine that, uh, that we're in the center and that there are, the spectrum goes to the left and right of us or around or up and down, but we're in the, the middle of it. The way we do things is just normal. Right. Um, so mm. it wasn't till I moved to Singapore and I got deeply involved in the local community and I was speaking at local schools and all that stuff and meeting a lot of people, um, that grew up in Singapore and often had never left Singapore. And I was often f feeling that they were wrong. I was like, no, you're living wrong. I'd meet people who'd say like, um, you know, I want to be a musician, but my parents said, uh, they wanted me to be a lawyer. So I'm a lawyer and I don't play music. And I'd say, no, you're doing it wrong. You should do, it. do what you love. And it took a long time for me to get into the mindset of understanding how what they did was right. It's just a different philosophy, right? But the, the epitome to me was when I spoke at a business school um, in Singapore. Like, here we are in downtown Singapore, like the prestigious business school uh, in central Singapore. And I I asked a question that I thought I knew the answer to. I, I said, okay, everybody in, in this room, raise your hand if you'd like to start your own business someday. And no hands went up. I was like, uh, did you misunderstand the question? Like come on, don't you want to start your own business someday? No hands went up. One hand reluctantly went up. And I said, uh, okay, so I, I ended up calling on people that didn't raise their hand. Wait, why don't you want to start your own business? And she said, well, why would I take the risk? I'd rather just get a good paying job. I was like, huh. And I turned to somebody else said, why don't you want to start your own business? She said, well, I don't have any ideas. Um, and that just blew my mind. That's when I finally realized the extent of the difference, because I feel like in America, if you ask a room of people in business school who would like to start your own business someday, I think like not only would every hand go up, but like somebody would run in from the hallway to raise their hand if they weren't even in the class. Like everybody wants to start their own business. And it's like, what, a, what an interesting, stark difference of, uh, of values that would... Anyway, so yes. Um, that's the most extreme example, but I just find it constantly, even here in New Zealand, which is almost the same as America, there are subtle differences in people, you know, to be ambitious is, is a, uh, is a disadmirable trait here. Um, mm. and things like that, that it's, it's subtle, but yeah, then I, I finally realized that yes, in the, to go back full circle to the, the spectrum that I realized I grew up on a far end of the spectrum of individualism, uh, feeling like I was normal and in mm. the center, but no, the way we are in America is kind of off to one far end. One thing I noticed from your website was that it seems like you're very happy and content living in New Zealand. I think it's just a throwaway line towards the end of your, the homepage is about 
you being quite happy to have thrown away all your other places of residence or places where you previously resided and now you're in New Zealand and you're quite happy about that. What in particular makes you most happy to live in New Zealand? Hmm. Well, first I should say, I'm just a happy person anyway. So I could be That's true. I could be equally happy saying like, all right, I live in Oxford now and I'm just happy. And I was like two years and two months ago today, I was very, very happy living in Oxford. And then COVID hit and just visa things and sent us back to New Zealand. Um uh, New Zealand to me is no, I mean God, I've never talked about this. That people who get into really bad accidents and get paralyzed for life, like quadriplegics, and people who win the lottery and are instant millionaires. Five years after the incident, both groups are equally happy, um, which seems amazing. But I think there's a certain kind of um, resigning yourself to your fate. You kind of say, okay, well, this is my situation in life. So how can I make the best of it? Um, I'm talking more about the, the paralyzed person than the millionaire, the lottery winner. But um, when COVID hit, uh, I was yeah, living in Oxford, England, and I had moved there for two reasons. One, the great schools for my kid, and two, for the travel. And COVID instantly shut down the schools and shut down all travel. And... I was really disappointed in that. And then, like I said, like visa things sent us back to New Zealand where uh, the schools are fine, but it's the worst place on earth to try to travel from. You're really out the middle of the ocean. Like it's an 11 hour flight to the nearest destination besides Australia. Um, so moving back here, I had to somewhat kind of resign to my fate of going, well, I guess this is it. I'm going back to New Zealand, which I love, but I can't do these other things I want to do. I wanted to be a citizen of the world. I wanted to have a few homes around the world. I wanted to be constantly nomadic. But circumstances led me back here, so I'll make the best of it. Um, I did choose it. It wasn't like I was thrown here by accident. Like, it's it's my single favorite country in the world. If, if you had to pick only one place to be for the rest of your life, um, this would be the one for me. Um, so, uh, did that answer your question? What makes you happiest to live there? Um, well, number one, just choosing to be. You know, it's like... Hmm. Hmm. Sometimes people set out to do, like, they have a certain goal in life. They want to be an Olympic athlete. And then they can't like they just they they don't get accepted by the coach. They don't get accepted by the Olympics. And then they just have to make the best of their new situation. Uh, they choose to be OK with their current lot in life. And mm. so I love New Zealand because uh, of just the obvious reasons. It's it's gorgeous. It's very outdoorsy. It's very natural. I think it's a very healthy culture like I mean, the, the people who live here, I think, have a quite a well-balanced, healthy mindset. I I agree with their values. But all of that stuff could mean nothing if somebody was deciding to be unhappy about it. So I think I just chose to be happy about being here. Like to, It's a decision. Actually, going back to, you know, the Buddhist book about relationships, marriage, Buddhist marriage counseling, um, it's choosing to let go of the things that bother you instead of to focus on them choosing to focus on the things that make you happy uh yeah sorry it's mostly just a choice i love that 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 makes a lot of sense and in new zealand you did a five-day hike without your phone <laughs> and i'm curious to learn more about that Wait, experience. did i talk about that publicly and i didn't i didn't know that that was out there you did oh, okay yeah you definitely did <laughs> So what what did you learn about yourself from doing that hike? Oh, nothing. <laughs> um, no, that's not very unusual for me. Um, 
I'm sorry. I know I, I must sound like a real luddite or something, but I don't really spend more than a minute or two a day on my phone. Uh, I have. I just use it for calling people and sending a few texts with friends, mostly saying "call me," because uh, uh, I just talk on the phone. But even then, I have a few days. Uh, yeah, I very often hardly look at my phone all week. So to go on a hike for five days. Uh, you must have noticed the detail that I didn't have my phone, but for me that was not a big detail. Um, so that was just yet another hike. But I do that almost every week. Like uh, I spend half of the week, I'm a full-time dad every week. So half of every week, uh, my kid and I just go off into the woods or into the forest or playing in the hills or the, the craggly rocks where the uh, by the uh, airport where the... Uh, Waves crash in. We just play in the tide pools and find little starfish and things like that. And I spend like at least half my week just completely offline, just giving him my full attention. So, yeah, five days walk in the woods without my phone was not, you know, <gasps> how did you do it? What did it, did it change your life? No, it was just that was pretty normal for me. Um, yeah, luckily, my wife and kid are the same way. So none of us use our phones. It's like we're from New Zealand. Like it's... We're very outdoorsy. We like to be outside. It's funny. I did uh, five days with no technology in the, in the middle of the mm -hmm. woods. And when I tell people about it, they're often like, that's the craziest <laughs> thing ever. How, how did, what, what went on? Like, how did you survive? And I, I did notice some differences mm. in you find? what my mind state was like. Well, I noticed that in the first couple of days, my mind was running for the phone and the dopamine that I would get from text messages and social media. And it was expecting that and it didn't get that. Mm. But it, it's almost like you've completely phased out that or never had that dopamine or that yeah. um, rush of like, I wonder when you were in the thick of your business, you must have gotten a lot of emails and messages and people needing you for specific things before you outsourced everything. And I'm curious, like when you went from all of that dopamine and all of that, that inbound to then not having any responsibility for your business, when you had outsourced everything, did you notice any difference in your mental state? See, I think, you're implying a, um, what do you call that? An immediacy to all of it. But I think even when I, hmm. like my email load hasn't changed. Like I still answer a couple hundred emails every That's week. That's true. Personally, and I always did. Um, but I never do them urgently. Um, so in hmm. fact, I don't know if I should reveal this secret. Um, I almost never reply to an email until after four days because I don't want people to think that I'm ever going to be an immediate replier. So I will deliberately only answer my, like say if my inbox has 300 emails, 100 are from the last four days, I will answer the 200 and then I'll stop um, so that those more, more recent ones don't think that uh, they can expect an immediate reply from me. But I've always been like that. Like if, if you email me, I'll probably get back to you. No, I will always get back to you, but usually within like four to seven days. So this discourages people from ever thinking they can shoot off an email to me to get a quick answer to something. I, do, I won't do that. And I never did. So um, ever. ever. You never no. did that. Fuck that. I'm not going to be wow. I'm not going to be somebody's slave. I'm not like your little, you know, sit, come, <laughs> you know, I'm not going to be your dog to come at your command ever. So, no, I, I want to teach people that like, no, I, I will be like the cat, <laughs> not the dog. You know, if you say come <laughs> here, I'll, I'll probably like turn my tail and walk away. But, you know, maybe later tomorrow I'll come sit in your lap if I feel like it. <laughs> um, no, we should we should teach the people that interact with us um, the the rules of engagement. Hmm. So <laughs> one of the things that I really like about my dad is that he's a quick responder in that if I send him a text, he'll always respond very quickly to me and he'll always put me first. Do you think that responding immediately to the people you love in your life ah. or something like that uh, gives you g shows a level of love or attention or care to them? See, you just made an important distinction. Like this is your dad. So 
to yes. me, like my, again, my, I don't mean to dwell too much on the phone thing, but like my phone has no social media apps. It has no email account, but it does, there are like 20 people in the world that have my phone number. So if mm -hmm. one of the 20 people that I love enough to have given them my phone number, if they text me, then yeah, I'll stop what I'm doing. So, um, yeah, if a good friend needs to talk, I'm right there. Um, that's just a different, I distinguish between that, like that little insider group because yeah, the rules of engagement, right? Like the, I've, my rules of engagement for the 20 or so people in my life that I care enough for this are just like, yeah, anything you need two in the morning, two in the afternoon, I'm there for you. Um, that's different than the public. Yes. That, that makes a lot of sense. And I'm really grateful for you drawing that distinction. One of the stories that I found out about you when doing research was about, I believe, a famous Broadway musician or oh, a writer who... Yeah, so, yes. Sorry, go ahead. W what happened with him? <laughs> well, that's really sweet that you know that story. Yeah, in fact, just the fact that I just said 2 a.m. or 2 p.m., I'm quoting him exactly. In fact, I think I can just name his name. I don't think he'll mind. Uh, Jeff Marks, M-A-R-X. Uh, you can look him up on Wikipedia. Yeah, he wrote uh, the great Broadway musical um, Avenue Q. Is that what it's called? Avenue Q? Um, and Book of Mormon. And wow, uh, another one I forget. But like Jeff and I just met at the TED conference once, and he was wearing his Avenue Q t-shirt. I was like, hey, you're the dude that made Avenue Q. I love you. And he's like, oh, my God, you're the CD baby, dude. I love you. And so we just became really good friends. And, um, yeah, we used to talk on the phone, uh, like, once a week or so. But I was, like, I had him kind of up on a pedestal, right? Like, he's this, like, Tony Award winning uh, VIP that I really looked up to. So I'd I'd often, like, email him and say, like, uh, Jeff, are you available to talk next Thursday at, uh, say, 4 o'clock? <laughs> and, and then he's the one that said, dude, I'm your friend. Like, call if you need to talk at 2 in the morning or 2 in the afternoon, just call me. I'm your friend. I, I will always stop what I'm doing. And, yeah, what's funny is that I was really, really touched by him saying that. But then he's the one that ended up taking me up on that uh, more than I did. So, uh Almost always, if my phone rings at two in the morning, I know it's Jeff. <laughs> you know, nobody else does that. But I thought that was really, that was really sweet and endearing. So yeah, that's that's amazing that you knew that. That when I said two a.m. or two p.m., I'm actually quoting Jeff Marks, and you got the reference. So thank you. <laughs> yes. Well, it's funny because I feel like the best feeling in the world is when you admire somebody and they also admire Hell you. Similar to yeah. what you were talking about before. It's the best. Yeah. So other than Jeff, what are examples in your own life when that's been the case? Oh, this is embarrassing. Um, when, as you can tell, I like books. <laughs> and so when I love a book, I very often email the author to tell them how much I loved it. And I'd say one out of every three times the author says, oh, my God. I'm a fan of your work. And like that, oh, that's the best feeling. Like I had no idea that they knew who I am, but you know. Um yeah. That's all. No, buddy, you wanna divulge or or speak Oh god. Uh speak kind words about. Oh god, it just happens all the time. Um No, I mean the um I'll just you know, let me just pick one. That like Mark Manson, um Best. Yeah, it, it that guy just um yeah, I just I I think it was before his big book came out and I just loved his articles so much that I reached out to him and just said, "Man, I just I love your writing. You just and he said, "Oh my god, I love your writing." And uh actually the first 8 million or so copies of his Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck book um had my quote on back because he sent me a rough draft of it before it was published. Actually, I kind of helped, uh, I was trying to help introduce him to publishers be, to get that book deal. Um, and when the book was published, he, he had asked me for a, a blurb. So then my blurb was on the back cover and, uh, cause I loved that book so much and I forgot about that. So later I'm like, I was like in a 
one of those tiny little airport bookstores that only sells like 20 books. It was like a little tiny airport in Fiji, actually. And uh, I was like, oh, wow, look, Mark's book is here. And like, I was just like, ah, oh, this is so cool. And I flip it over and it says Derek Sivers. I was like, what the? Oh, fuck, I forgot. <laughs> like, I'm on the back cover. Um, so no, Mark still just continues to... Um, almost every almost every writer, even the writers I like, I think that I can improve on what they say. Like when I do my book notes, mm. uh, that my Sivers slash book webpage, um, whenever I do my book notes, I take what the author has said and then I usually paraphrase it into a way that I think it could be said better. And I put it into my own words. Um, Mark is one of the only writers I just can't improve a single word. Like every sentence he writes, I'm just like, that's, there's no way to say it better. That's just the best. I try. Sometimes I'll even wow. put in like 10 minutes of, you know, furrowed brow to think like, how could this be said better? I'm like, no, that's, he nailed it. That's the best. So um, anyway, yeah. Going back to an earlier question, why are you so obsessed with writing? Hmm. It's not the writing. It's the thinking. It's like, mm. I really want to find another point of view. I love those moments when you read something or now let's just say like you when you hear an idea that changes the whole way you think of the world it's like it changes your entire life up to this moment and it changes your future because sometimes you get somebody gives you an insight into the human condition that makes you think back about your whole life going oh yeah now i understand why this happened or that makes more sense now. Now I can put this into a different perspective. Wow, that really helps me understand. And then it changes your life in the future because now knowing this, if you remember it, then it can change the way, way you uh, interact with the world in the future. Those moments to me, like nothing compares to that. Those are the best moments in the whole world. All the other things you hear are great in life, you know, whether it's love or money or uh, bungee jumping, don't compare <laughs> to... To those moments where a, a, an insight makes you rethink your past and future. Um, and so knowing that those are my favorite moments in life, I want to also create those moments for myself, but especially for others. Like I want to keep finding mm. insights into life that blow my own mind and then find a way to share that with others uh, in a way that's effective and enticing and that i got chills while you're saying that tears tears started to well up in my eyes because you are responsible for so many of those moments for me personally Badass. like the 43 45 wow. you know story like every you go through tim ferris and you you go through the whole catalog and we'll put every single one in the show notes because when when you said some of those ideas and then after going through those podcasts i then go through all of your blog posts and i'm like oh wow this oh wow this oh wow and it's just like non-stop and we could do hundreds of podcasts literally on just every blog post because you are are so responsible for so much of my thinking wow. and for updating so much of my thinking and so it uh it makes sense that you say that to me in this moment thank you you so, know it's funny just you. like two weeks ago uh, i had an interview with kevin kelly where i was saying the exact same thing to him it's like he interviewed me for his Cool Tools podcast. And like he's like, all right, uh, let us know some of the tools. I was like, wait, before we do, it's like, you changed my life. <laughs> I was like, so much of like how I think of the world is like because of you. I just have to say thank you. So I, I love it. Thanks yeah. for telling me that. Yeah, absolutely. And so on the topic of you being so interested in thinking and coming up with new ways to say things differently and to look at the world differently. You play this game with your son often that I'm now going to play with different people in my life, which is the game of opposites. Ooh. For example, you talked about <laughs> what's the opposite of music. You said you thought about it for a week and instead of silence, it, it became business. Yeah. And I thought that was so clever and interesting, but you said in a different podcast 
that the opposite of leadership is meandering. Mm. And I would love for you to explain a little bit about this and why this is the case. Mm. Good one. I'd forgotten about that. Um, I was a bad leader at my last company at CD Baby because I was acting like an explorer. Uh, explorers weave around, try a path, experiment with this, go down this route, find out it's a dead end. They reverse course, climb a tree to try to see better, uh, go into a cave for a while to see what's there, come out. That's how to be a good explorer. Uh, you try things, you experiment. But that makes you really hard to follow and very frustrating. So the easiest person to follow is someone that goes in a straight line. Someone who says, see that mountain in the distance? That's where we're going. Every step leads us there, onward, right? That would be a good leader. So I think the lesson learned is you need to explore privately, um, or like say just solo, meander on your own and explore without asking people to follow you. They can follow if they want to go on the exploration with you. But before you try to lead others, you need to decide on a destination. Uh, then you can boldly and clearly communicate the plan and be specific about the reward they can expect to get at the end. Like, how will you know you've arrived at the destination? Clear plan, clear reward, easy to understand, easy to follow. Um, that's what makes a great leader. When you've had different periods of your life when you've meandered and different periods of your life when you've led, and how much of that was intentional? Of, oh, I'm going to lead in this moment, or oh, I'm going to just meander now. No, I think I've never, that's what I meant. It's I've never been the, um, I don't think I've ever been a good leader. I think when I look back at CD Baby, I was a really frustrating mm -hmm. boss um, because I was doing the exploring thing. It was like the company was 100% mine. I had no investors, no other shareholders, no other co founders. It was just me. So I would often explore. I'd say like, hmm, let's try this approach for a while. And then my employees would be like, what? You're changing the plan entirely? And I'm like, yes, I am. Let's try this approach. And I would do it for a few months and go, oh, nope, never mind. Don't like that approach. And they'd go, oh, God, it's so frustrating. You know, so, um, yeah, I was a bad boss. I was a bad leader. Um, so I think I've just, it just helps me to say like, no, I've, what I was doing was not leading, I was exploring, and I should not have tried mm. to be a leader. Or, like I just said, if, if, you, if I do again someday want to be a leader of other people, then I'm going to have to just cease my exploration for that project and just say, that is our destination, straight line, let's go. Let me ask you this now. Do you view yourself as a leader of your child? No, no. Um, yeah, I thought about that when like thinking about the definition of leadership. It's like, <laughs> I mean, th there would be some parents who would say, all right, here's the plan. You're going to be a lawyer. <laughs> you're going to be rich. You're going to live next to me. You're going to have two kids because I want grandkids. You know, this is what you're doing. No, I would not want. I think that would be. Uh, I don't think leader is the right, right way to describe that relationship with uh, a kid. So, no, I think I'm his fellow explorer. Um, yeah, we definitely meander. No, we definitely, I'm his fellow explorer. I think a lot of children probably long for that type of relationship of having an explorer as a parent. Yeah. What would you say to a child who is in the position of being led by a parent that they don't want to be led by? Oh, God. <laughs> Um, I don't know. Uh, encourage your parents to um, come explore with you. Kind of say, wait, look, you know, mm. look, mom, look, dad, come here. 
come check this out. I think you'll like it. You know, um, sorry, that's the best I got now. No, that that makes sense. Um, and on that topic of the way most p- parents lead, it it's very common for parents to view themselves as leaders and. And I would go so far as to say that's a norm of American society today. Hmm. Maybe that's a, I don't know if it is, but I would, I would assume it is. And if you agree with that, it's like, why do you think that people are so inclined to follow the norms of society? Well, (laughs) actually, I love that you connected this to parenting because let's think about babies imitating is the most natural instinctive thing of all like babies and young kids imitate everything that's how they learn they they look at what's going on around them and then they imitate like that's what they're speaking is imitating you know moving is imitating walking is imitating it's our instinct so for most people that probably just carries through for their whole life. So I think you need like a really strong drive and a big desire for something different in order to not just imitate, right? Like, like let's use a metaphor. Mm. Most people are floating downstream. And if you want to float downstream with everybody else, there are great rewards because that's what everybody wants you to do. They say, come on, come get on the boat with us. Float downstream. All the sexy people are here. Grab a beer. Kick up your feet. Um, yeah, join all the, the sexy people going downstream on the boat. And it's very, very attractive. It's very enticing to get on the, the boat floating downstream with everybody else. And so it really takes kind of a weirdo to... We'll use the mountain metaphor again to say, I don't want to float downstream. I want to go up to the top of that mountain. And the people on the floating downstream on the boat will say, what are you, nuts? It's freezing up there. And nobody else is. There are no sexy people up there. There's no beer up there. Come on. And you have to have this drive to say, like, no, I want to go up that mountain. And I know it's going to be hard. And I know it's going to be less fun. And there will be less sexy people, <laughs> but that's where I—that's what I want to do. Um, you have to have that drive. They'll say that you're crazy, and you have to say—you just have to understand that all of the values that they have are values that support floating downstream. And so suddenly, even mm. if they say, like, you know what you need in life? You need a paddle. <laughs> you go, okay, that's good for you. <laughs> Because that's what you're doing. That's not what I'm doing. And they'll say, you know what you really need is you need like a reclining chair. That's what you need in life. And you'll say, no, that's for you. That's not what I'm doing. So suddenly you realize that all of their values are to support what they're doing. And that's fine for them. You go, okay, that's for you. But that's not what I'm doing. I'm doing something that's the opposite of what you're doing. So therefore... All of the things you're saying just don't really apply to me. And that's it. Mm. Is this why you got along so well with the Olympic athlete who sent you an email? <sighs> Dude, that's very personal. <laughs> that was like the one of the great <laughs> loves of my life. Oof. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sorry. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> that's damn. I was not expecting that. Um you know, is that why we got a lot? Yes, actually. Okay. Um, yeah, we had that in common. I fucking loved her. She, um, yeah, as soon as we met, it was just, um, I so, she's just kind of a hero of mine. I love the way that she says, uh, I asked once about like friends that call her on the phone and want her to hang out. And she, and she has this French accent. She goes like, uh, what, you mean like sitting on couches? Like, no, I do not do that. I do not sit on couches. Nobody would ask me to sit on couches. They know who I am. I was like, ah, oh, that's so cool. Like, yeah, ba- basically she just, uh, I'll use the floating downstream metaphor. She just established really early in life, like before the age of 10, like I'm going up that mountain. And she basically just 
stopped associating with the floating downstream people and um, only associated with fellow mountain climbers. Why do you think we appreciate mountain climbers so much? And do you think that people floating down the stream also appreciate the mountain climbers? From a distance, uh, it's... You can you can think, oh, cool, somebody climbed that mountain. Yeah, God, you know, I'd like to climb a mountain someday. <laughs> but, but not badly enough to actually do it. It's just nice to think about, which is fine. Mm-hmm. It's Daydreaming is underrated. Uh, but, yeah, I think we admire people that did things. God, it's like, I hadn't put it into these words before, but, like, the the people who had the actual massive drive and persistence to follow through and do the thing that you just occasionally daydream about right like mm. i would i would like to learn mandarin chinese i think it would be a really interesting language to learn i don't want it badly enough to actually do it i've been saying i want to learn for like 15 years but it's always like down there at like priority number 12, you know? And when I meet somebody that learned Mandarin and became fluent, I'm like, I'm like that person looking at the mountain climber. I'm like, oh, that's really cool. Wow. You did it. Can you tell me something in Mandarin? So you could read this right now? God, that's so cool. And I really admire those people because they actually had the drive and persistence to do the really difficult thing that took them years to do, whereas I just occasionally daydream about it. I think that's a really good point because a lot of people would look at someone like you and be like, that's a mountain climber for sure. But the point is that you are a mountain climber in some aspects, but you're also somebody who floats down the river in other aspects. And how beautiful is that to see that in one part of our life, we could be something and another, we could be something else. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, it's not binary. It's not like you're either a mountain climber or you're not yeah it's different aspects yeah thanks for bringing that um that's an important distinction yeah because it's nuance and and that represents so much of what you're about to me at least is the ability to look at a situation and be like well in this case it's true and in this case it's not true and what is the the most surefire way of intelligence is Holding two things in your mind at once. Yes. Is what F. Scott Fitzgerald says, something like that. Something like that. But, you know, somebody asked me once, like, <laughs> you write so short and simple. Do you think that truths in life are simple? And I said, no, 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 no. The opposite. Truths in life have many, many nuances. I'm not speaking truths. I'm speaking in short little ideas that can spread like dandelion seeds like they don't not they don't they don't contain the contain the entire truth no the truth is always so nuanced it's always just like well in this situation and if you're this kind of person who wants this kind of outcome and if this this and if that well then maybe this but if you're that kind of person this mm-hmm. or if the situation is not right well it depends who you're talking to and it depends what kind of day or what you want in life and it depends on your background and you know then that it's <laughs> it's Truth is not on bumper stickers. Uh, Those are always oversimplified. And hopefully the people spreading them know that they're oversimplified. Because those big complex nested uh, if this then that, those don't spread easily. Uh, The simplified things will spread. But it's up to you as an individual to know for your personal situation and in your context and for what you want in this, considering where you are... And who you're around, then this is the appropriate tool to reach for in the toolbox. Um, It's a shame when people kind of champion a tool and then try to use it for everything and say, everybody should do this all the time. That's that's never the truth. Yeah. Well, do you ever find difficulty when so many people ask you for advice directly of what should I do with my life? I assume a message you're getting a lot is, well, I'm dealing with this situation and this is what's happening. What do you think I should do about it in that situation? Do you ever have, yeah, that's a common email. So what happens then when you inevitably write something back to them that doesn't contain all the nuance and you're writing. So you're trying to 
maybe produce an idea. Do you have, do you ever struggle with that idea of trying to give them truth versus trying to just write something well? Yeah. Um, I often just, I very, very often point people at articles that I've written in the past. That's why all of my URLs are so short is because I memorize them yes. because I, I just think of them. I mean, I use them often. Like if somebody says, oh, you know, I really want to, I've, I've got the, my art. I really want to do my art, but I need to make money. And I say, uh, siv.rs slash balance. Like, check this out. Um, somebody's talking about parenting. I'm like, uh, sive.rs slash pa. Like, I've just got all my URLs memorized because I use them often in emails. Because if somebody asks, if I, like, I should say, if, say, like, three people have asked me the same question then I try to, and I've typed out my answer in full because I don't have an article about it, then I need to write an article about it and then memorize the URL so I could just use it. But I always try to, yeah, let them know, like, look, I don't know your full scenario, but read this and maybe it helps and let me know if it doesn't. And then people will often mm. either reply back going, oh my God, that's just what I needed to hear, or thanks, but that doesn't really address the real problem. And then we can get into, okay, well, what was the real problem? And so I try to give it like that. It's like a very slow if then, like, does this help? If not, reply back. Okay. Then a week later, I'm like, okay, what about this? No. Yeah. Never trying to present well, it. Well, this, this goes back to, sorry. Yeah. Sorry to cut you off. No, this goes back to the idea of the people who are following your message or who are reading your stuff are very thoughtful in nature. So it's unlikely that they w might take your what you write as a blog post as a prescription to follow 100% if it doesn't apply to their life, which is something you've curated. Yeah, and maybe because we're just doing an email like, you know, hi, my name's Gabriel. I live here. I read your book. I have a question. They know it's like, I don't know your whole life. I don't know your scenario. I only know <laughs> these three sentences you just sent me. So, um, yeah, luckily it's not like a a friend or if somebody was even being a mentor like that's the difference to me that's why i don't want to be anybody's mentor because that involves like such a deeper relationship like really knowing somebody's full scenario so you can really give them very customized um situational advice well talk a little bit about w what you do when you are seeking a mentor's advice <laughs> you know the answer don't you <laughs> Uh, well, yes, but <laughs> the people listening might um, not. I, in fact, I didn't want to name him by name in that article. Um, so let's use a specific example of Seth Godin. Uh, Seth Godin and I are friends. We've met up a few times. We've talked a few times. Um, I look up to him like crazy. And so whenever I'm in some kind of a pickle, <laughs> and I'm not sure what to do with with this situation, I think I really want to know what Seth Godin would say. And I think, well, but he's a busy guy. I don't want to bother him until I've put some thought into this. So I'm like, what do I think Seth would say? If like, first, how do I describe the question for him? So I'll take a lot of time to, um, to, to explain to the question. Well, to explain my scenario as succinctly as I can, Try to get to the essence of the question. Like, what is this thing I don't know? What does it really come down to? And then once I get this question defined really specifically, then I think about asking it to him. But then I think, okay, well, let me try to predict what would he probably say to this. And then I try to counteract that. I mean, I try to ca respond to my imagined answer of his. Um, and by the time I do that, the whole problem solved already. And I could just, and then I sent him a little email saying, Hey, Seth, thanks for your continued inspiration. And he replies back saying, Thanks, Derek. <laughs> and that's it. That's how I <laughs> reach out to my mentors. I've heard about a lot of fiction authors having some insanity to them because of they're playing so many different characters in their own head. Mm. I'm curious if you've ever written fiction and or if playing different characters has messed with your psyche in any way. Mm, never wrote fiction and no, not messed with my psyche. I think it's a really helped. Yeah. It's, I think it's really helpful 
to be able to mm. imagine um, what other people would say. Okay, so the you know the question Danny just asked me about my uh, what I do with mentors. So listening audience, he already knew the answer because I wrote an article about this. Which in fact the URL is sive dot rs slash m e n t. The first four letters of mentor, um, and we'll put it in the show notes. I I highly recommend this process for anybody. It's like you've read um you've read books, you've listened to people's podcasts. It's not so hard to pause and think to yourself, what would this person say? You know, like just pick anybody you look up to and think, what would that person say to my scenario? And I highly recommend this process instead of just thinking, I need a mentor. I need somebody to tell me what to do. Which is, of course, is enticing. Mm. In fact, I thought it was one of my favorite quotes from Andy Warhol is in his autobiography. He said, if I could hire anybody, I would hire a boss. I just want somebody to tell me what to do. Um, and of course, it's it's really <laughs> attractive, this idea of um, having somebody just having somebody wise just tell you what to do. You know, I just want to follow orders. Um, but no, I think it's it's up to each of us to imagine what this person whose thoughts you know well would tell you what to do and then imagine another one like i have a friend of mine who's like very much an army guy he was in the military forever and his whole like outlook on the world is very much like this is the right way that is it like he's very much that classic leader there's the mountain that's where we're going and i love thinking what like what he would say to me um and we're friends so i know his I know his thought process well. Um, so no, I think it's a really healthy uh, ability. No, it's a healthy ability to cultivate. It's a healthy practice to do. It's to very often think what not just one, but different people in your life would recommend you do in a certain situation. Yeah, and this is an interesting place to tie it around to your perspective of people when they die is especially creative people. It's like, well, they didn't die because you could still play their music and they could still be alive. And it's like similar for a mentor. If the mentor dies, you can still say, oh, I know what this person might say. And on that point, I know that one of the things you're doing is you're having an autobiography released the week you die of yourself, which is is the first I've ever heard of anyone doing something like this. It might have... probably has been done before, but I've never heard of anyone doing it myself. What gave you that idea to do that? And why has that been such an interesting project for you to pursue? Um, those two are tied together. That one of my mentors was a good friend and a very wise person, and he was killed uh, riding his bike. Uh, You can search up the story online. Uh, Milt Olin, M-I-L-T-O-L-I-N. He was one of my favorite people. We were close friends. We like, I called him on a Wednesday and he's just like, oh, hey, I'm with somebody right now. Can I call you on Sunday? I said, yeah, no problem. And then like two days later, I got an email from a friend who said, hey, I I guess you heard about Milt, huh? I went, what? No. And I looked at the news and it's like Milt Olin killed on a bicycle. Um, And so I often found myself saying like, God, what would Milt say? And I was so disappointed that he didn't write down his thoughts more or share his life in writing. It was just like, if you were in conversation with Milt, you got Milt, but he shared none of it in writing. So I was lucky to have Milt through conversation, but damn, I wish he would have written down more. So that's what inspired me. Like, I really need to write down more of my life. But then... I have read a few people's autobiographies that that are only up until the point that they're writing it. So, you know, they're like 65 years old and they're writing their autobiography. But hey, but what about the next 20 years? Like, you're going to keep having thoughts, right? So really, the the best autobiography would be the one that goes all the way up until death. Um, and then I thought, well, just through, you know, through constantly adding to it and constantly writing new stories and chapters, I can just set up a system where I keep adding to this all the time and then I just have instructions to whoever's around after I die. Like, hey, and when I die, please log in and do this and take this and this and then compile it and put it out this. The template's already ready to go. Go. And so, yeah, my autobiography uh, 
could and should be published uh, the week that I die. I'm sure it also gives a level of significance to everything you put in that book because there is an assumption that, oh, wow, this could literally be the last chapter. <laughs> God forbid. But, it, you know, like it it, it, it puts a, a weight maybe that I, you never considered. Did you of the understanding that like, wow, this could be it? Or do you not think like that? I don't. Or maybe I'm just morbid. No, no, no. I, I, I don't think like that with the book, with the writing, but I think like that with hmm. life at all times. Like that's, you know, when I said about the yeah. urgency, you said like, how do you avoid social media? It's like, ah, because I'm fucking urgent in everything I do. Like it's, I'm always thinking like, I want to do this before I die. I don't know how much time I have left. This might be it. I might die next year. You can't delay this thing. I might die in six months. Like, don't procrastinate. I have to do this now. So I have that thought with me at all times. As far as like the autobiography, um, no, I mean, it's also not a super top priority for me. But like, let's just say my website, the SIVE.RS website, is my legacy. Like, yes, things will be compiled into a book but really like everything should be on that site like in fact anybody listening to this if this idea interests you a lot please email me because i'm thinking about starting a new project that would be like a trust set up to help keep people's web presence alive for a hundred years so if you've got a website mm. that's like a personal website that you're really pouring your persona your soul into um i think it'd be really cool to like create a trust that and, and a system that's set up to make sure that that website stays active for a hundred years you know for decades after you die so that people who know of you or knew you a little bit or heard of you can still go to that website and know that that url will go to that website that's up and you won't have to depend on your you know nephew to do it for you if there's like a trust in place where it's like this is the purpose of it um yeah that interests me a lot i'm thinking about making that my next project so if this interests you please email me well i'm interested so you got your first email right. from me thank you right coming coming <laughs> coming up but we have to take this baby home derek because i want to be respectful of your time and i'm curious from the 27 conflicting answers from how to live which is the one that you are currently living in this moment and why <laughs> all right um life is not a problem to be solved but a paradox to be experienced um i think we all have a deep need for stability and we all have a deep need for uh, novelty, right? So, but that's the problem. That's why somebody gets married because of their need for stability, but then suddenly they lack all novelty in their life and they have a deep need for novelty. So then they go cheat on their spouse and then maybe they get divorced and their whole life's in a shambles because of the divorce, but they're now they're longing for stability again. So they get into another relationship uh, and so on back and forth and back and forth. Um, but with these conflicting needs, they're always asking, well, which one is correct? Like, do I live a life of stability? Is that correct? Or do I live a life of novelty? Is that correct? Um, do I live for others or do I live for myself? Which is correct? Should I focus on making money or should I focus on making art? Which one is correct? Um, do I indulge in the present or invest in my future? Which one is correct? Which one should I do? So I think of instruments in an orchestra All right so if you can picture an orchestra and imagine you ha imagine it's your orchestra you have the full orchestra in front of you okay so you are now the composer and the conductor which instrument is the right one the whole question is moot right like the question itself is wrong because it's not the question is not an or. It's not like, is is the oboe or the violin correct? It's like, no, you use time. You use time and combinations. So you can wake up and invest in your future 
and Live for Others a Little Bit in the Morning by Ann Singer, your email, and go make some money, and then say at noon, your kid barges into your room, and you suddenly drop everything and give your kid your full attention, kind of like when the orchestra suddenly drops out and there's a single oboe that keeps playing. And like the composer decided, yeah, like now we've got all the instruments, poop, now we've got just one. And then the others come back in. So as you know, your kid walks out of your room and you go back to making some money and focusing on others again. But then at dinner time, you stop and you say, now I'm going to focus entirely on myself. And now you work on your art and now you live in the present instead of living for the future. And like, this is the, these are the, the way that like all the different how to live ways um, are constantly in flux, like throughout minute, you know, uh, throughout a single day, minute to minute, they change. Um, so to answer your question, um, I'm always living all of the different ways to live. Um, so my, my book, the How to Live book, was meant to emphasize the paradox and discourage the question of even thinking which one is right. Um, that's why the title, How to Live, is ironic. Derek, I thought I understood the book when I read the conclusion, but I understand it so much more clearly <laughs> when you explain it. So I'm so grateful for that. Thank you. I just gave away the punchline to anybody. For... Uh, you were supposed to be a little confused by the picture of the orchestra at the end of the book. But if you've listened all the way <laughs> to the end of the Dan and Miranda pa <laughs> podcast with Derek Sivers, well, now you've, you've got the answer. Derek, I can't thank you enough for, like I said, influencing my life in the ways you have and this incredible conversation. I'm so grateful we can use this as an artifact for our children's 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 hopefully. And I'm just, I'm, there's no, nothing I could say that could let you know how grateful I am for you as a human being. So Thanks, thank Andy. you so much. And is, is there anything you'd like to leave people with as we end this episode? <laughs> if you listened all the way to the end, send me an email and I will reply within four to seven days. <laughs> no, you really should. Anybody who so listened much, all Derek. this way, it's like, I, I love these conversations because of the people that I meet because of them. So, um. Yeah, you asked me a lot of deep questions, dude. I really poured my soul into this one. So uh, thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you for being willing to go there. So we'll we'll put your email down below and please send this man an email so we can <laughs> just spam up his inbox with thoughtful, interesting, kind, insightful messages. <laughs> Thanks, Danny.